Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Three years ago, we started as the knowledge partner working with the World Economic Forum and Secretary Kerry and the State Department to um, focus on how to spur demand for advanced uh, decarbonization technology. And the progress that we're seeing today, I think, really exceeds where we thought we could be at that moment with just a very small number of companies and, uh, and the United States with 13 countries, nearly 100 companies. But now's a chance to go from talking about the intent to talking about the reality of making it happen. And the objective of this panel is to have four leaders who really see the challenge of decarbonizing value chains both from the supply end and from the demand end. And that's a very unique perspective. I feel really privileged to be on stage uh, with all four of them. I'm very conscious of the time, so we'll unfortunately just get uh, quicker answers to this to keep things moving along. But, um, but I'm gonna start with you, Andrew. Um, you've spoken about a value chain-wide approach to emissions reduction, and obviously shown a high level of voluntary ambition at Fortescue. And I guess it'd be very helpful to hear what is your sense of the incentives, the regulations, the partnerships that are needed to significantly enhance investment to move even faster? Okay, thank you. Look, I think we should start with a really simple question, sir. Um, to governments here, um, to all corporations, I think the question we should ask of any of our leaders is, when are you gonna stop burning fossil fuel? It's a very simple question. It should have a date attached to the answer. And if the answer's in this decade, I think a big hug is worthy. Um, if, uh, if it's first half of next decade, maybe a slap on the shoulder. But if it's after that, then you really should be followed by the question, well, we know you can. And, you know, I talk, I want to address hard to bad industries. I mean, I'm in them. Um, I'd say... Uh, I'll be a bit lazy to abate these industries because the answers are there. We are burning right now, I'm happy to put it out there, one billion litres of diesel a year to be a supplier of around 20% of the world's iron ore. However, we're going to switch that off completely in about four to five years and stop burning any fossil fuel. So that has meant we've had to lean into governments to say, Will you continue disincentivising us to go green while you incentivise, say like the Australian government, with a $10 billion incentive to keep on burning diesel fuel? Will you not call for this ridiculous word net to be actually left behind in the human lexicon? As John Kerry pointed out, I mean, in that first, first Earth Summit back in Brazil, that word net got shoved into the human lexicon um, in order to get the fossil fuel sector to the table. But I'm sharing with you as a scientist, not as an industrialist, we generally don't trust the word net. I, mean, I meet with companies all over the world, scientists all over the world. As a director, we're held to account on telling the truth. If we knowingly lie, we could face a jail term. And using the word net in our company, where Australia's most successful company in many decades, that word, we think, is going to face putting us in jail because we know we're not actually eliminating fossil fuel. We know we're not actually eliminating carbon dioxide. We're actually using a carbon credit system, which in the main is at best unreliable. Yes, there's a rump, which is great, but you don't want to bet the world on that. And we're approaching governments and we're approaching shipping companies like, say, Maersk, uh, our own suppliers and saying, we'll take the first technological challenge. We'll be the first mover out there with the arrows in the back. But when we demonstrate it, big suppliers, big governments, would you please allow, for instance, our ship into your ports? Right now, ports all over the world, if you want to bring in a fuel which is going to destroy your children, that's no problem. Come right on in. Come right on. Bunker sea oil, it's disgusting come right on diesel, it's going to cook your planet, come right on. You want to bring in a pollution-free ship? Hold the phone. Hold the phone. What's that? I mean, what? So I'm asking governments across the world, collaborate with us, open your ports, get the thinking done very quickly because the planet is burning very fast to allow your ports to regulate 
pollution-free fuel to come in. And I have to say, and I'll just close on this, we're all collaborators here. We're collaborators because we are here, firstly, in this room, and second, because we're learning, if we don't already know, that humidity is what is starting to kill off the human race. Humidity is what you cannot regulate against. You can regulate against heat. I mean, you know, I can take you into a heat chamber in Singapore where this water's going to boil next to you. You're not going to feel great, but you're going to be OK. But this water will be boiling. But if you put a puff of steam in that heat chamber, you're going to die quickly. And that's what's happening to the world's water vapour. It's accelerating many times above heat, and it's causing people to die as I speak. And therefore, the action we must take must be immediate because the deaths I am seeing as a scientist are happening today, tomorrow, yesterday. And this means the time for talk is over. COP28, the time for talk is over. If you don't want to be seen as the greatest greenwash in the world, if you don't want to be seen as a great trade fair, we've actually got to take some serious actions here that the world knows we're going to commit to. Thank you for that call to act. Thank you for that call to action, Andrew. Jan, I want to talk about Wholesome. Cement is a challenging industry, as we all know, and you've been working with partners on all ends of the technology readiness spectrum, from low-carbon cement offering to customers, uh, EcoPlanet, to partnership with Volvo on electric trucks, to supporting startups and think tanks on accelerating uh, innovation of building decarbonization solutions. So you've really been pushing on many different fronts uh, quite hard. Uh, could you just talk about some of the lessons that you've learned from these partnerships, and particularly what you've learned as a supplier, different from what you've learned on the demand side of FMC? You get to see both ends of it. Uh, no, look, it's, it's very exciting, and I, I love this first mover coalition because we can only solve the problems uh, together. So in the past, we were producing our building materials, supplying them, and we had all the know-how in-house. Now to decarbonize our operations, uh, we need not only our customers to work hand in hand, we need uh, companies like in the First Mover Coalition to make new formulations, to make our processes uh, a net zero or better zero. Uh, and, uh, and then we have to uh, recycle all the old buildings into new buildings. So we have now a big variety of partners from very big ones to all the startups. We are at the moment uh, working with more than 100 startups uh, to come up with new solutions, which is quite an exciting journey because we have not done that five years ago. Um, I would like to share one, one story, Rich, which uh, we are, as the largest building materials supplier, we have a large logistic footprint. Uh, we deliver more than 100,000 truckloads to our customers every single day uh, of the year, 100,000 trucks. And now uh, we want to make them uh, to zero, and that means uh, electrification, the first step. And in the past, there was a lot of chicken and egg discussion, you know, do we wait for the next battery technology, do we wait for hydrogen, or do we wait for, for other things? And uh, what I like about the first mover is just do it, you know, we don't have time to waste. And we have, in the meantime, electrified every single moving equipment in our company. So from the trucks to the forklifts, of course, but also to the loaders, to the excavators, we have at least one model because we want to electrify this whole amazing fleet of more than 100,000 vehicles. And um, while we did that, um, one of the very positive surprises was that we actually uh, increased the satisfaction of employees and customers. And, and that's quite simple. Our employees love electric vehicles because they have no emissions. Uh, they have no exhaust. They have no noise. And, and that's fantastic. And the customer is the same when you, we normally come with the heavy truck to the construction site to deliver. Uh, the materials, uh, they all want electric trucks now because they have, again, no emissions, no noise, no uh, big diesel engines, um, and sometimes the trucks are waiting for 20, 30 minutes at the construction site, and with electric, this is all smooth and all preferred. So that's our big learning along the journey. While we have a lot of technology available, we still have to develop a couple more uh, technologies together. There are also benefits from uh, decarbonization beyond uh, 
saving the climate and the world from the customer employee side. And I'm, I'm enjoying that part very much. And uh, so I'm happy we are here. Our industry, the front runner, we made uh, similar commitments here with Volvo to purchase the next 1,000 electric trucks to, uh, to accelerate this electrification of all our fleet. <laughs> Hilda, first of all, congratulations on the great announcement we saw a, a few minutes ago. It's really fantastic. Uh, renewable uh, energy is one of the largest unlocks if we're going to decarbonize aluminum, since electricity accounts for about two-thirds of aluminum emissions. And I wanted to ask you to speak from both angles. I'm going to start from the angle of how producers can collaborate with energy players to ensure access to the resources they need. Then we're going to look downstream on the other end. But I'd love your sense of this uh, collaboration between you and energy producers, and how do we make that go even faster? Yeah, as you say, uh, renewable is at the core of the decarbonization for, for aluminum. And, and Hydro today is an aluminum and energy company simply because we realize that uh, energy is at the core of um, of having affordable uh, power prices, but more and more the source of uh, the, uh, to, to get to zero uh, with the renewable energy source. Let me give a perspective of, uh, of, of despite the, the, the government's ambition uh, in terms of uh, bringing more renewable energy into, into the equation, the, the, um, the, 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 the speed is simply not uh, fast enough. And, uh, and this is a concern to me as a set of hydro, but also for the, for the overall green, green transition. And one of the concerns is that what we see is that there is a lot of resistance uh, to, uh, to the development of, uh, of uh, wind parks, of uh, solar cell park, uh, and it's not in my backyard uh, perspective. Uh, and, uh, and people rise up and... and, and, and and, um, and, and resisted both because of nature, but also because of the, 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 the effect on the local uh, environment. And, and, and these dilemmas are real. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, we need to have, to have this dialogue that we, together with the energy companies, take that uh, dilemma serious and in order to, to build understanding and reducing the resistance and conflict to secure more renewable energy. That's uh, one of my main concern these days. In Hydro, we, we have been an active producer of energy for 118 years, uh, but we see, see now that we have to be even more active to develop uh, renewable energy. And we are doing so. We are building wind, wind parks now and solar cell park in Brazil. We're doing that also in Scandinavia. And here we look for, uh, for energy partners that share our approach in the sense of having that dialogue, to have that consent before we uh, start to, to, to uh, on an embarking on, a, on an energy project. And I think that is uh, an important part of releasing the, the opportunity to, to, to make sure that we do have affordable renewable energy for the aluminum industry. That's wonderful. And I want to take a minute. I know we're short of time, but aluminum is one of these products where there's also an enormous recycle secondary use potential. Mm. And I wondered if you could now flip it from the other end, working with your customers and trying to help accelerate the use of recycled mm. aluminum, secondary mm. use aluminum. How do you see the role you can play to help that end of the journey as well? And thanks for that question. That's an area where we are investing a lot these days in terms of recycling because aluminum is fantastic in the way that it can be recycled and recycled without losing its properties. And uh, some of you would not know perhaps that 75% of all aluminum that is ever produced is still in use simply because it can be recycled and, and, and recycled. And, uh, <clears throat> And, and what is also, uh, and, 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 and if you bring back aluminum after having been in use in a window or in a car or, or in, a, in an application, uh, then it's used. So then it has, uh, it, 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 you account for zero carbon uh, in, the, right. in the product. Right. And that's the fastest way to actually per, to, to deliver uh, uh, carbon-free aluminum. And, and, and what is interesting also these days is that I find that when we collaborate with customers now, we, we are not only uh, fighting for the, or, or discussing the price, but we are discussing how could we produce a, a kilo or ton of aluminium uh, with the highest recycling content. And then you, 
you start to discuss also how could we tweak on the, on the specification in order to be able to increase the recycled uh, portion. And that, and that didn't happen before. Then it was only a discussion between the procurement and the sales. This is a specification, give me the lowest price. Now uh, we see with the, with the, with, with the traction for, um, for, for um, the demand for low carbon aluminium, we, we have technologies that can work together to find the best way to produce the, the, um, based on the need, based on the recycled content. I think over and over again we hear when people start to prioritize uh, the carbon footprint mm -hmm. and you get the customers working with the suppliers, you find solutions that weren't in the consideration exactly. set before and I think you're giving a perfect mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. of one of them. So Sultan Ahmed, um, thank you for being here. And you missed the chart I think that Borga showed that showed that you're one of the new FMC members this year. So congratulations and it's fantastic to have you in this community. Um, so, so DP World is one of the largest port operators in the world. It's looking to decarbonize its own operations through technologies like methanol fuel as well as electricity. But you're also a really important player in the value chain of shipping uh, and significant in, in how you're developing the infrastructure to help in the decarbonization of ports. So again, you get to see this from a couple of different angles uh, given, given your role in the overall uh, ecosystem. Could you talk about the role of port operations in facilitating shipping's transition to a low carbon future? You have to know uh, that 80% of the trade is carried by sea. That means the shipping contributes almost one third of the carbon emissions. Uh, we have two issues as far as the shipping industry. First of all, the fuel is not available, uh, which is unfortunate, and it's expensive. But also, we need, as in from the port side, we need to provide facilities for storage of uh, alternative fuel. This is very important. In our case, in DP World, uh, we we have really noticed. And this is really an eye-opener for us. When people look at alternative energy, a lot of people think it's going to cost more. I can give you examples, many, where we changed and we saved money. A good example is all the uh, terminals in Jabal Ali. We have these floodlights. And the electric bill is about 10 million a year from that. We changed to LED. It cost us 10 million, but our bill became 1 million. So we saved almost 9 million just by, for one year cost, we saved, we, we could convert it. Uh, we changed also our uh, equipment from fuel and diesel to electric, less break, breakdown and better. Uh, in, in addition also, we have invented a system whereby we will eliminate the, the, the port equipment in the yard. And we have something called Box Bay. And you can Google that, actually, uh, in YouTube. And Box Bay is a system where you store the containers 11 high in the front of the cranes. And you don't need equipment. It goes from the crane straight to this building. And you can shuffle them all, again, electric, and can also uh, use uh, a green uh, fuel, and also solar. Uh, the other thing is also, in, 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 not only in the terminal, even in many terminals, we have example in countries. In Brazil, for example, uh, we electrified all our equipment and we're using biofuel. In even Antwerp, we have produced from the garbage and the waste uh, biofuel. In uh, Dubai, uh, in fact, our engineers have converted our tractors from diesel engines into electric, the same one that was in diesel. Actually, it's now electric. It is cheaper for us, and it is invented by our people, of course, with collaboration with people who are good at that. Uh, in many countries, we, we did that also. Now, of course, I am very proud that to announce that DP World has joined the First Movers Coalition. Uh, signing up will allow us to ensure that 5% of our marine power will come from zero emission fuels by 2030. 
uh, in Jabalali alone, all our office building for our customers are all electric. Because we're on the grid, so we use about 30, 35 megawatts. We produce 45. So we are saving money. The question is, a lot of people sometimes have this wrong information or the convention that using alternative fuel is expensive. It's not. It's actually cheaper for us, and we protect the environment. Thank you. So I'm very conscious of the time, and we have another great set of, uh, another great panel, of great set of CEOs. So I'm going to wrap us up now, but I just want to close. Andrew, Jan, Hilda, uh, Sultan Ahmed, uh, I just want to say thank you for your leadership to try to accelerate the technologies that are critical for the decades ahead with your commitments in the First Mover Coalition just makes an enormous difference for you and companies like you and to share with us the real world experiences of how do we make that really happen at scale quickly. So let me, can we please join me in thanking the panel?